So my favorite atypical dementia is actually ALS, and um, this is my usually basic introduction slide, probably not very much needed. It's the third most common neurodegenerative disease, and it really focuses mostly on motor neurons in the cortex and in the spinal cord and the brainstem. And it's a very aggressive disease, no treatment. And I guess the interest to this crowd is the fact that a small but defined percentage of patients goes on to develop frank FTD, and more than half of the patients develop um, cognitive deficits, at least when tested. So TDP43 is really central to the pathogenesis of ALS. There's no doubt about that. And um, there have been two major observations that back it up. The first one, which is actually the second one historically, is the genetics. And the fact that, although vanishingly rare, mutations in TDP43 or in the gene encoding TDP43 uh, do cause disease. And that is a fact, and it's uh, really strong. And before that is instead the pathology finding from Manuela Neumann, who just spoke. And uh, in 2006, the fact that TDP43 is in the inclusions and in TDP43 pathology, and that really this, in ALS at least, maybe this is slightly overabundant, this shows 98%, but definitely over 90, 95% of patients do have TDP43 pathology. So, not in the detail of Ian McKenzie yesterday about TDP43 pathology, but basically, for the sake of this talk, it's the fact that Although TDP43 is not just in the nucleus normally, in immunohistochemistry you really see it mostly in the nucleus. And in disease, two things happen. One, it's not in the nucleus anymore, it's depleted from there. And two, it accumulates in different forms of inclusions or patterns in the cytoplasm. And as I just said, this happens in nearly the total amount of uh, ALS patients, and it also happens in a significant part of FTD and also of other atypical dimensions of the muscle uh, called inclusion body myositis and inclusion body myopathy. And we'll need this information during the talk. So what is TDP43? It's an RNA binding protein, and actually most of what we know was from work done here in Trieste by Emanuele and Tito Baralle's lab. And uh, again, for this talk, we really need to focus on the fact that the protein has two RNA binding domains, RM1 and RM2, and it has a C-terminal glycine-rich domain where the low-complexity domain is. And this is important because the human mutations are basically all in this C-terminal uh, part. And we know that TDP binds to RNA like crazy, more than 6,000 transcripts, it really binds a lot. It's ubiquitously expressed, and yesterday in Vincent's talk, he used the same scheme, and it's actually quite small because we don't really want to go into detail, but it's been involved in most steps of RNA processing. Transcription, splicing, microRNA processing, transport, stress granules, you name it, there is some evidence that it's there. Our lab really focuses on the splicing and the transport, and we're going to talk about splicing today. So, from the initial observation, really from the path, you know, the initial thing that, okay, there's um, no TDP in the nucleus anymore, so what's happening? Is it the loss of function of its RNA processing in the nucleus? Is it doing something excessive in the cytoplasm? And this still is not that clear, or at least what really plays a role. And actually, if you even take a step back, what's well, st still an open question is actually, does, it's an RNA binding protein, but does the disease mechanism have anything to do with RNA processing really? And actually, do mutations have an impact in RNA metabolism? That is still actually an open question. So I'll talk to you briefly about some human tissue work that we did in the past and that we've revived recently, and then some unpublished data on uh, mouse mutants. So from day one, um, given all the information that was known on TDP43 and its relation to RNA, um, different researchers used brains to try and see if, if they could see this, this, this pattern. And um, a problem with brain is that actually it's entate tissue, it's poor quality for RNA. And although it can be useful, as we saw from two talks yesterday, it's, I think, very hard in brain to go and define very specific uh, RNA profiles. And uh, Boris uh, in the audience knows something about that. He was one of the authors in the initial works using brain to try and define the TDP signature. And that wasn't really possible and definitely not clear. Um, so what we did is, well, we took the approach and said, well, why don't we use the atypical <laughs> dimension of the muscle? Why don't we use muscle tissue? And the reason is actually opportunistic, not because of an interest in muscle, but because of the fact that you have TDP43 pathology and you have lots of advantages. One advantage is that the muscle biopsies are not taken end stage, they're taking the diagnosis, so early on. And they're of ex the RNA is of excellent quality because by definition, the clinical samples are frozen immediately. 
And it's very easy to do path and uh, transcriptomics on serial sections. So these are really interesting features that really we have to consider for muscle. So we went on and at the time we did that, we saw path of TDP and on the adjacent section at the time we did arrays, not RNA sequencing. Differently from uh, Vincent's talk yesterday, we were lucky enough for the different diseases to cluster. And uh, the work was interesting. It brought us to actually highlight that many other HNRMPs are changed. We had this finding that I think is quite interesting. We found at the time that HNRMP A2B1 and C are also mislocalized with a granular pattern muscle. And as you can see in adjacent sec sections, a fiber which has TDP doesn't have the HNRMP and vice versa. So it looks as if the different fibers, different HNRMPs go off at different times. That was all quite interesting. But actually, the reason why we got in there is to see if there was a TDP signature. We didn't really find one. We did see this, that there's a TDP43, if you knock it down, long intron genes go down. We vaguely saw that in the muscle, but I wouldn't say that was convincing enough to really state that there's a TDP43 signature. So I guess from muscle, what we can see is that, yes, it was useful. We saw a um, actually more widespread alteration of HNRMPs, which is, I think, what now we s clearly see also in brains and spinal cords from ALS and FDD. But that really, it wasn't enough to find this CDP signature. So we tried to use mice to try and have a better setting to potentially address these same questions. And so this is the, the word introduction to mice, basically. Um, and it goes like this. Basically, and this again worked mostly from Emanuele and Tito Baralle, TDP43 autoregulates sales really tightly, very, very tightly, through a very complex mechanism. And so it means that if you mess around with levels, you create a havoc, okay? So if you reduce TDP43 levels in knockouts, they're lethal by embryonic day three. So it's dramatic, and if you take it down in specific cells, well, they die. It's very toxic loss of function. Um, and if you overexpress it, even at subtle levels, you re even the wild type, you really create lots of splicing and RNA changes. So to some extent, these models, knocking down in specific cells or overexpressing, have been useful because they do recreate some as aspects of disease, so as models, but they're not very useful to understand the early stages of disease because you're creating these artificial changes. And so really the need is to analyze TDP mutations within the endogenous gene to know what's happening. And so that's what we did. And uh, today I'm not going to talk to you about knock-ins, which we're also looking at, but we're look talking about older work dating from screening uh, a chemically induced uh, mutation archive. And so we're going to be talking about two mutations, which are not human mutations, but one is in the crucial biological domain, RM2 domain, we'll call it the RM2 mutation, and one is in the LCD next to the uh, human mutations, and we'll call that the LCD mutant. And again, then we'll start with the data, but this is another important introduction slide. Both mutations in the homozygosity are lethal at the end of uh, pregnancy, so you can still get tissue from them. And that was actually good news. It means that both mutations have a biological effect. Um, but a peculiarity is actually that when you put them on mixed background, one of them, the LCD mutant one, the patient-like one, actually survives. So at some point in the talk, initially we'll talk about embryos, at some point you'll have some adults popping up, and it's because on mixed background, and that's not un untypical for mice, they survive. Even the fast knockouts, for example, congenic, embryonic lethal, mixed background, they survive. Okay, so the first thing, back to the original questions, do these mutations have an impact on splicing? So the first thing we said is like, let's use a classical assay. Um, and again, an assay from this town, this it'll apply to TDP43, it's a mini gene, and the CFTR mini gene, usually normally in cells, it's spliced 50%. If you knock down TDP43, you just get the high band, okay? In our RN2 mutant mice, you actually get a very similar picture to the knockout. In the homozygote, you just get the high band, and that is maybe expected. But what was really unexpected that in the LCD mutant, you get the opposite. Okay, so the splicing changes go the opposite direction. So always by our tPCR, we checked another classical TDP43 target, sortilin one, identified by Don Cleveland in 2011. And again, in the knockdown, it goes up, and in our RM2 mutant, it goes up. In the other mutation, it goes down really telling us that at least at this point, we're seeing a loss of functional splicing in this mutation, actually a gain of function, which is really unexpected in the other mutation. So we didn't know why, but on the RM2 mutant, the hypothesis is, well, it's a mutation in the RM binding domain. Does it affect RNA binding? 
And indeed, if you do MSAS with two different radioactively uh, tagged RNAs that bind to TDP43, you see that in wild type recombinant, it binds with increasing doses to the RNA. The mutant binds, but in a much, much reduced way. We did clip on these mice as well, and we saw that the pattern is the same. So the specificity of the RNA binding doesn't change. It binds to the same RNA, but it binds with much lesser affinity. So it's truly a hypermorph. So then that was just two RT-PCR. So we decided to take this a bit more genome-wide. And what we did is we did a series of RNA sequencing data sets, the RN2 mutant versus its own litter mates, the LCD mutant versus its own litter mate, and actually a silencing of TDP43 versus a scramble. And here we're plotting the effects on splicing. So each, and we're comparing the different data sets. So each dot here, for example, means that it is an exon, and this is an upregulated exon in the RN2 mute, and it's an upregulated exon in the knockdown. So it goes the same direction. And so when we compare, for example, the RN2 mute versus knockdown, all the significantly, double significantly changed exons are either up and up or down and down, confirming that it goes in the same direction. What instead goes in the opposite is when you can uh, compare the LCD mute both versus the, knockdown, uh, versus the knockdown and versus the RN2 mute, the changes are all in opposing direction. So we're here confirming that the loss and gain of function happen uh, transcriptome wise. <coughs> So to take it a step forward and see, fine, the changes happen, but do they really biologically counteract? We decided to cross the mice one to another. So as I said before, if you generate homozygote of one mutation or the other, they're both lethal. If you generate compound heads, no endogenous TDP43, just the two mutants, they actually, not to a Mendelian rate, but they start surviving. And that was actually really, really striking. And when you look at the RNA in these mice, while you had hundreds and tens of changes of splicing and expression in both the homozygote in the compound heads, basically the changes are down to a very, very reduced number. And this is an example of what happens. Look at this X on here. It goes up in the RM2 mute. It goes in the opposite direction in the LCD mute versus zone control. And in the compound heads, it basically stays stable. So here we're really showing that these two mutations have um, counteract at the biological level. I mean, they cause survival and they really have opposing effects. And that, is, that was all good. So we had a tool to study gain and loss of function of TG43, which is actually quite remarkable. And so we said, fine, and actually the LCD mutes survive to adulthood. So what happens then? And we started looking at the RNA-seq data of the adults. And this is just volcano plots for splicing changes. So the delta PSI, so the percentage of splicing inclusion, is plotted here. So the blue ones, it means an, an exon is increasingly included, the reds increasingly excluded. And as you can see in the LCD mute and in the RN2 mute, both have up and down regulated exons, but we saw a striking increase in down regulated exons in the LCD mute, and exon skipping. And this was actually corroborated by the binding we were seeing here, which were more TDP related. So we looked at these with a bit more care and attention, and we started seeing these, which I think are really interesting uh, events. So we're seeing exons that usually are included, 100% constitutive exons. And in our loss of functions, they're included, but in our LCD mutation, they start being skipped. And so we defined these, we defined, we said, let's see if many of these events happen. And so we took all exons that are included more than 95% of the time and then have a very significant exclusion change. And we identified nearly 50 of them, um, which is interesting. We started calling them skeptic exons in the lab and we validated a number of them with, with RT-PCRs. What was really interesting to us is that these seem to be the opposite of what Phil Wong's lab had described in science a couple of years ago with the cryptic exon. So he had shown you knock down TDP43 and you have exons that start appearing out of, out of nothing or at least out of the unknown. And he called those cryptic exons. So we looked at them and in our loss of function model, indeed we see many, that's not that novel, it's a confirmation of, of their work. Uh, but we, it's interesting that the cryptic exons we see in our loss of function mutant definitely are not present in our gain of function mutant. Uh, so really showing the opposite effect. And, and is TDP directly involved in these events? Yes, it is. So this is an RNA map. So basically we collapsed all the cryptic exons. This is, these are all the cryptic exons we have in our mice and the flanking introns. And we did put on it all our clip data. And as you can see, 
the cryptic exon, so the ones in which you take out TDP for three and they appear, have a strong TDP binding to the exon itself and the downstream intron. If you do the same with the skeptic exons, you actually get the same pattern, which is remarkable. So it means that TDP binds to those exons and to the downstream uh, intron, and by some direct binding gain of function, it has them excluded. So this is just a summary, and the summary of, of the splicing findings. So TDP basically binds in many places in the genome, and unfortunately it does different things. So sometimes it totally represses a sequence, Sometimes it binds next to an exon that is alternatively spliced and it modulates it. And sometimes it binds and doesn't really do much, at least that we can see. So what we see in loss of function, it loses this function and therefore new exons appear, cryptic exons, and there's an imbalance in alternative splicing. What we're showing here is that in gain of function, as you may expect, there's an opposing imbalance in, uh, in alternative splicing, but also you get these totally new trans uh, transcripts for the genome in which exons that are always included start being excluded. So we looked at them in a bit more detail, and it was known that the cryptic ones are very non-conserved among species, and that was why Phil Wong had a lot of trouble in translating them to human. Um, skeptics instead, they're constitutive exons, and so they're really well conserved. And obviously this then begs the question, do we find them in humans? And, and the problem has been that we've not found any public available data with TDP mutations from IPS or anything. It's loads of C9 mutations out there in the public domain, but not much TDP43. Um, and we've asked directly many collaborators and people, so we just tested a bunch of human fibroblasts, which is not the ideal, and we did validate a couple of these skeptic exons, but we are really hoping that there will be more consistent RNA-seq high-throughput data coming out there that can help us in the future. Um, so that's the question about conservation, and do they play a role in any way? Do they do anything? And what we did see is that they do affect the transcriptome because they do impair the expression levels. So in the transcripts that have um, the skeptic exons, nearly 30% of them are significantly downregulated, and indeed they contain an increased amount of toxic variants that probably target them to nonsense mediated decay, although we did not experimentally validate that yet. So what happens in these mice that have this gain of function and that grow old? Well, this is the classical um, grip strength. So this should be actually six months. At six months, they're normal. At one year, they start showing changes significant. And at two years, they have frank um, grip strength deficits. Two years is a long time. I appreciate that. Um, when we do something a bit more reliable than the grip strength, so we do muscle physiology, you stimulate directly the sciatic nerve and you measure the tension of muscles. Again, there's a confirmation that there is a, reduce, a reduction in, in, in strength. And when you buy physiology, you calculate the motor units, there's actually a reduction in motor units. Um, this is all at two years, which is really uh, down the line, but I must say that in ALS, all models with endogenous mutations have not had phenotypes much earlier. Actually, many have not had phenotypes at all. So we were actually quite pleasantly surprised by actually getting a progressive neuromuscular phenotype. When we looked at the cords of these uh, mice, we could see that in the ventral horns, a bit in the dorsals, but clearly more in the ventrals, there were lots of P62 inclusions, and that these were also ubiquitin positive. We then looked at TDP itself in the cord. And before we get to the pathology, uh, one interesting observation was that actually the levels of TARDBP were significantly increased throughout life in these mice, okay? And not just the levels of expression, but also the autoregulation mechanisms were, was clearly activated, although protein levels appear to be normal. And this is interesting because it has been proposed many times that the vicious cycle of, of increased upregulation plays a role in disease. So we now know that these mutations actually induce this. And whether this predisposes to a second hit, I don't know, but it could be a path to follow. But then although the RNA is up, proteins are normal, pathology, no TDP43 pathology at all. And this to some extent is not surprising because even transgenic mice, Overexpressing TDP43, the ones from Don Cleveland and others, do not develop any TD43 photology. Our mutation is not a human one, but it behaves in, in in vitro basic assays. It alters the LCD like the human mutations. So I really think 
that either there's not enough time for this or potentially this is really a species thing that we need to deal with. And so I guess in conclusion, uh, on the mouse side, I think what we're showing here, which is interesting and really novel, that the mutations in the LCD domain actually do have an effect on an RNA directly, and it's a gain of function, a slicing effect. And this effect works through the binding of DDP43. We showed that this leads to novel events, and when I mean novel events, it means that these events produce transcripts that are not present in normal mice or individuals. So uh, this could have a pathogenesis implication and also a biomarker implication, because it's an all or nothing effect. And that the mice, which again is quite interesting, with an endogenous mutation, do develop a progressive neuromuscular phenotype. And that um, says it all about the field of modeling ALS, which is really uh, unsuccessful, but it is a success in this uh, very poor modeling field. Furthermore, I think what it says is that loss of function definitely is going to play a role at the end stage when you get no TDP in the nucleus, but is dispensable for initiating the disease. That is clear. And gain of function alone is enough at least to start it. And um, that the TDP43 mutations uh, escape the normal autoregulation. And I guess I already said that before, that it's the TDP43 binding itself that is crucial to this. Uh, that was a missed slide. So these are the acknowledgments. The work was really mostly done at the ION by uh, PhD students in bioinformatics, uh, students and postdoc I share with Vincent Planiol, and the mice were generated by Abraham Acevedo, who is now in Tenerife, and uh, Elizabeth Fisher. So yes, he's a good person to know and get invited to give talks to. And uh, a lot of work was done, uh, all the EMSAs and the initial characterization with the help uh, of Emanuele and Tito Barale, and Emanuele has been actually quite instrumental throughout in advising, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>